Okay, so I'm uh, just going to start from the beginning again. My name is Ben Finio. I'm a fourth year graduate student in the Harvard Microrobotics Lab, and we're going to talk to you about our research on bio inspired microrobotics, which is a bit of a mouthful. So I'm going to start out just by explaining what that actually means, because it's kind of buzzwordy. Break it down into two parts, the first of which is bio inspired. So bio means life, and inspired kind of means to get an idea or take inspiration from. And when you put that in front of robotics, you get bio-inspired robotics, which is actually different than bio-robotics. So just kind of getting all the buzzwords straight here. Bio-robotics, um, which they might do some of at the med school here, I'm over on the engineering campus in Cambridge, is more when you're thinking about artificial organs, prosthetic limbs, you know, an artificial heart, that sort of thing. That's different. Bio-inspired robotics is when you take an idea from nature and then try to transfer that design to a machine, in our case, a robot, usually animals, and there are lots of examples of things people have done out there, really exciting stuff. Um, a lot of it's in Boston, where you take an animal in nature, say a bat or a dog or a tuna, and then build a robot that can move in the same way. A lot of this was actually done in Boston. This robot um, was built by a company called Boston Dynamics. The tuna was built at MIT, but you notice these guys are all pretty big, right? Tuna are pretty big, the dog's pretty big, and we do micro-robots. So the second question is, what is a micro-robot? And you hear micro, you might automatically think microscopic. You know, you probably can't see it with your naked eye. But it turns out that's not exactly true. The definition of micro robot is kind of hazy. I think somewhere along the line, some scientists figured out that if you slap micro in front of whatever you're doing, it sounds cooler and it's easier to get funding. So, <laughs> yeah. technically, you know, they're just tiny. Let's call it that. Kind of vague, but you know, here's some pictures of things that are considered micro robots. And you know, people like to take pictures of them next to coins, so you can kind of get a sense of how big they are. And you notice that these guys don't look like animals. They just kind of look like regular machines. So when you take those two things and put them together, you get what we do, which is bio-inspired micro-robotics. Not microbiotics. I'm pretty sure that's not a word. A lot of people know. Innocent mistake. Even um, Jeff and Marshall actually accidentally introduced us as the microbiotics lab when we did a practice talk. Um, it just kind of accidentally matched the words together. But two separate words, bio-inspired micro-robotics. And the three main things we're going to talk about um, between me and Rebecca are flying robots, crawling robots, and squishy robots. And I promise I'll go into a lot more detail on all those designs, because you're probably wondering what they even are at this point. But before I go into detail on what they are and what they do, I'm going to back up and try and say why. You know, Some of you may be wondering at this point, OK, that sounds kind of cool, but why do you need to build tiny flying or crawling or squishy robots or whatever? And to motivate that, Let's think about robots you might be a little more familiar with from everyday life. So I'm not thinking about movies like WALL-E or you know, Transformers, Terminator, where you have robots that can fly and run and jump and talk and all sorts of crazy stuff. Just think real life robots that you, know, you could actually go either buy at a store or find at a factory or whatever, like you know, an assembly line robot that's pretty much just a big robotic arm bolted to the floor that picks up something from over here and places it over here. So that's to do. One of the main tasks robot are, robots are for and better at than humans is doing very repetitive things. So, you know, pick something up, put it there, pick the next thing up, put it there, on and on and on all day. That's not something you're too likely to have in your home, though. How about, just show of hands, does anybody have a Roomba? Does it, so does anybody not know what a Roomba is? Just, just in case, I'll explain it. It's pretty much a little robotic vacuum cleaner. It's about the size of a dinner plate. You can go buy one at Target or whatever, bring it home, put it on the floor, it'll drive around and suck up the dirt. And you know, it's really, I'll get to in a second what this guy can actually do other than you know, take dirt up off the floor. A couple more examples, though. Have anybody seen YouTube videos of Asimo? A little humanoid robot about three or four feet tall can kind of walk around awkwardly and maybe go up and down stairs and shake hands with people, but nothing too crazy like in a movie. And lastly, does anybody know what a PackBot is? Just show of hands. So this is actually made by the same company that makes the Roomba. They have a vacuum cleaner division and a bomb disarming robot division, which is kind of <laughs> um, I don't know. I guess it works. So you can see this guy is actually used a lot in Iraq and Afghanistan and domestically by police bomb squads because you can remotely operate it. You know, there's some guy not shown in the picture. He's a safe distance away from that explosive driving the robot, and then he's going to use this arm to pick it up and dispose of it safely. And then, you know, if the grenade explodes you'll probably lose the robot, but then at least you're not using a person. So that's a, a, losing a person. That's another big thing robots are for is to do stuff that's dangerous. You know, maybe working in an assembly line is boring, so use a robot for that. Disarming bombs is obviously really risky to humans, so use robots to do that as well. Now, let's think about 
all four of these robots, they kind of have a purpose. Let's think about what they can and can't do. For example, just in this room, you know, what if a robot wanted to come in and go up to the top and sit in the last row? Most of these robots can't do that. You know, this guy's bolted to the floor. The Roomba can fall downstairs. It certainly can't go back upstairs. <laughs> these guys maybe can kind of awkwardly slowly go up, but you know, if it's a really fancy spiral staircase, probably not. And you know, what if they have to open a door to get into the room? None of them have hands, really. I think they're starting to weaponize the packbot, so you might be able to put a gun on it and shoot through the door, but you certainly can't <laughs> open it and then close it again in one piece. And you know, these guys, definitely not. And then if you go outside of a house, say if you want to go out into the woods and go you know, over the river, through the hills, your grandmother's house, or wherever, and you have to cross a stream at some point, that's when these robots really start to fail. Obviously, the Roomba is not going to do very well out in the woods. It's for your living room floor. The Packbot kind of has tank treads. Maybe it could do it, but getting across the stream, I really doubt it. And then the last point here is these robots are all pretty big. So what if you need to go somewhere that requires you to be tiny? Like, what if you want to fit through this little crack in the wall? Obviously, all of these guys are way too big to do that. So you might still be thinking, OK, great. The robots can't fit through a crack in the wall. Why do you need a robot that can fit through a crack in the wall? Excuse me. And I mentioned you know, the packbot is to do things that are dangerous for people to do. And one thing that's really dangerous for people to do, and you should be familiar with this if you followed the news earlier in the year. Everybody remember the earthquake in Haiti? I'm assuming it was all over the news for weeks. And if you follow the news, you have people were being rescued days or weeks after the earthquake just because the rescue workers couldn't get to them fast enough. All right, you have human rescue workers. Maybe they were using search and rescue dogs to help sniff for people. But beyond that, there's really nothing you can do. You know, there's somebody could be trapped 10, 20 feet under that pile of rubble, and you just can't find them fast enough because you can't get down in there. So one of the big pushes, and we'll talk a little bit more about some other applications later. This is just one example for now for tiny robots that can move like insects is to have, after a disaster, not just you know, an earthquake, a hurricane, a terrorist attack, whatever, send them down in there and say, OK, there's a person trapped here. This is where you need to dig. There's nobody trapped over here. Don't waste your time. And hopefully, then, you can speed things up, make it safer for the people that are trapped, and safer for the rescue workers. Because you know, obviously, this guy's wearing his hard hat. But still, if that huge concrete slab falls on him as he's digging out, that's not going to be a very safe situation. So we hope that through the use of these robots, we can kind of decrease the level of danger in humans in situations like this. And we know that all of these types of robots are good at what they're built for, but they're not really appropriate for this. So we can't just adapt them. We have to come up with new designs. So just raise your hand if you have a guess. Can anybody think of something in nature that isn't a robot that would be good at you know, going down into a bunch of little cracks in a collapsed building? If you look at the title of the lecture, you might be able to guess. Cockroach, one. Other ideas? OK, shout it out. Don't bother throwing your hand up. Something that flies. Bees. Bees. Right. Insects are really good at kind of all those things I showed. Going upstairs, you know, you can just fly up the stairs. Going through a door, if you're small enough, you can just slip through a crack under the door. You don't actually have to open it. And you know, cockroaches and centipedes can climb up walls, all sorts of crazy stuff that robots really can't do. So as engineers, you know, I'm a mechanical engineer, and we think, okay, rather than starting with a blank slate, if we want to build a robot that can do this, why don't we look at nature and say, OK, animals are already really good at doing this, particularly insects. Why don't we figure out how insects work and then build a robot that can do the same thing? How do we get from here to here? And I'm going to talk about how we do that. You know, how do we actually design them? How do we build them? So the first part is how do we build them? How do you build something that's tiny, the size of an insect? And then the second part is how do you actually make them move, fly, crawl, or squirm, or whatever they're going to do? And so I said, I'm a mechanical engineer. Excuse me one sec. And you hear mechanical engineer, you probably think machines, right? Like really big, complicated, fancy machines with lots of moving parts. And I work on flying robots, so that's what I'm going to talk about the most. In the case of flying, you might think, we know how to make really big things fly, like airplanes, helicopters, space shuttles, whatever. We can make all these really big things fly. We've been good at it for decades now. So if you want to build a tiny flying robot, why don't you just build a really tiny airplane? And you run into a problem when you try to do that. And here's the problem. Anybody get it? <laughs> so here's two of our robots, a flying one and a crawling one. And then here's three kind of normal metal parts that you would find in an airplane or in a car, probably in the chair you're sitting in right now. And you know, relative to something big, relative to an airplane, this nut, nut, bolt, and washer are really small. But relative to an insect, they're huge. right? 
So there's thousands of these in an airplane, but you can't put thousands of them in an insect that size to build it. And sure, you can get tinier mechanical things, like if you have a fancy wristwatch, um, you know, a mechanical one, not a digital one, then you can get tiny little gears and stuff inside that. But even those are too big to build a mechanical insect out of. So the first part of our problem is, OK, what are we actually going to make it out of? The next step is not just what are you going to make it out of, but what are you going to use to put it together? Here's a picture of the fly next to the tip of a screwdriver and the tip of a hammer. Can anybody imagine, I'm sure you could think, what would happen if I took the hammer and tried to use it to put the fly together, right? It's flat. Even if I had really tiny nails, you know, I can't use them, big tools like this to put them together. Here's another picture. I think this is actually the one that was running on the subway in the ad for this lecture series. A little more zoomed in on the fly itself, and you can see there's all these really intricate little mechanical features that are, you know, the size of your fingerprints. Look at, you know, hold your finger up in front of your face and look at how tiny the ridges on your fingerprints are and then imagine trying to mechanically machine out something that small. Here's a picture that's even more zoomed in next to the word liberty on a penny. And this is a little mechanical part that goes inside the fly to help the wings flap. And, you know, this is just way too small to make using what we do to make a regular machine. So a couple questions at this point. Can anybody guess how we cut materials out at this scale? You think we could use scissors or a saw? Lasers. lasers. OK, good. People always get that one. So here I have you know, a $20 laser pointer with a dot that's probably a couple millimeters wide. Turns out if you spend a lot more of Harvard's money and get yourself a much fancier laser, you can get something with a dot that's thousands of an inch, you know, so small that you can't really see it with your naked eye. And you can go in there and cut out really, really tiny features. So that tells us how we actually cut stuff out at that scale. The second question is, you know, I mentioned we can't use nuts and bolts. What are we actually going to use? Can anybody guess the materials if they're not metal? Shout it out. Plastics, one. Some ceramics, um, usually not ceramics, a lot of plastics. Anybody know what carbon fiber is? No? OK, so yes, no. For those of you who don't, carbon fiber is a really strong, lightweight material. You find it in a lot of like fancy sports equipment is the best example I can think of, like high-end bikes and tennis rackets and boats and stuff like that. You know, you want those to be strong and sturdy, but you don't want your racing bike to be made out of steel, right? You don't want your tennis racket to be this huge thing you have to swing around. So carbon fiber is actually great for flying robots because it's so strong, but it's also really lightweight, and it turns out it's really easy to cut with a laser. So that lets us make all these tiny little parts, and then instead of hammers and screwdrivers and big tools, we actually use a lot of surgical tools, much like um, a lot of people at the med school probably use, scalpels, tweezers, that let you pick up and kind of put tiny parts together. Excuse me. And then another problem. Everybody see this problem? Right? So I mentioned, you know, I'm the mechanical engineer. I usually think about the mechanical stuff that I showed in the previous few slides. Honestly, I'm glad I'm not the electrical engineer because this is not a fun problem to solve. You have this battery that, again, is tiny relative to things we're used to, you know, tiny relative to your toys or your remote control for your TV or whatever, but enormous compared to this fly. There's no way this poor little fly is going to lift that enormous battery that weighs 100 times more than it does. So the electrical side of the problem is how do you shrink this down and get it on board so the fly can actually lift off and fly around. And again, sure, there are smaller batteries out there. You know, this picture is kind of for dramatic effect. You can go get a hearing aid battery or something that's actually much tinier than this, but even those the best batteries that you can just go buy off the shelf are way too big for something like this. So that's kind of how we build them. OK, so I'm going to move on to how we actually make these things fly. And again, you might think we know how to make big things fly with things like propellers and jets. Why don't you just build a really tiny propeller or a really tiny jet? But you run into the same problem. You can't just build a super tiny jet. It's not that simple. So even though engineers